Welcome to the second teaching that we're doing in this series. We are today going to be talking about leading toward anti-racism um, as, as we move forward in this conversation. Uh, it seems like I sent out an email that had an error that said leading towards racism, and that is not what we want to be doing. Um, leading toward anti-racism, we've invited some of our deans who are sitting in a place of leadership at the institution to talk specifically about what it is that they're doing, what it is that they're envisioning, um, what it is that they're concerned about, what they're passionate about when it comes to anti-racism work in the um, academic realm. Um, so we're gonna really focus on that today. We hope that they will offer us some ways of stimulating thought and action within other areas on campus because certainly they'll be talking from their um, respective areas. Um, but we do believe that what it is that they're sharing has meaning for the campus um, across all units here at the institution. So really we're hoping that you'll just be able to lean into the conversation and be able to glean from what they're sharing, how it is that you might be thinking about your respective areas. Um, today, really, we find ourselves in a really unique moment too. Not only, you know, uh, two weeks ago when we started this conversation, we were on the heels of the murder of George Floyd, um, which resulted, the murder of George Floyd, um, Breonna Taylor, a number of other people, and this really unfolded um, with the national protests that were occurring. And it really points to um, the need for us as higher education institutions to be engaging our students and in, 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 in ourselves, faculty and staff, in conversations about racism, anti-racism, anti-Blackness. Um, and so we really do find ourselves in that moment. It would also really be um, remiss of me not to point out that our own students at the University of Maryland, who for years have been making demands of the institution around um, anti-racism, um, have just recently gathered again in protest on our campus to be um, letting the institution know what it is that they seek when it comes to anti-racism. Um, we know that there are demands around defunding the police. We know that there are demands pertaining to the classroom. What is it that our faculty need to be doing to be, um, to be delivering anti-racist education while also monitoring how they interact with our students to minimize the harm that microaggressions and implicit bias have on students who are in the classroom. Um, we also know that there are ways to be thinking about um, what does it look like to have a racially just campus, not only when it comes to curriculum, but who's participating in education here at the institution. Um, and so we want to be able to lift up some of those broader thoughts for the, for the campus as our, as our experts are really talking. Um, so they will address some of those points, but really it's about how do we move forward with this, with this task of developing an anti-racist personality here at the university. Um, just to remind us really quickly about some of the definitions that were laid out last time, um, I talked about uh, racism be because we need to start there with a definition. Dr. Kamara Jones, again, who is the former um, president of the American Public Health Association, gave this definition in a podcast, and I think that it really fits and it's really easy for us all to access. She says that racism is a system. It's not a personal moral failing. It's not even a psychiatric illness. It's a system of power and it's a system of doing two things, of structuring opportunity and of assigning value. And it does those things based upon so-called race, based on the social interpretation of how we look. So again, here, what we really wanna be laying out is that we're really focusing on how is it that systems of power, systems of education, structure opportunity that favor people who are white or with lighter skin, while disfavoring those who have darker skin, in addition to what does it mean in the classroom to be assigning value, to be assigning um, worth to people who are white, whereas we take the position of not necessarily valuing the voices of those who have darker skin or who, are, who might be black in the classroom. Um, so that's really how we're thinking about racism. When we're talking about anti-racism, I really just use Dr. Jones's definition to come up with a way of thinking about this. But what I really wanted to make sure is that we were laying out is that anti-racism is also our approach to doing something about racism. We have to be behaving not just um, taking down names off of buildings, not just um, re, uh, well, taking off names off of buildings or thinking in terms of how it is that we change the surface, but what do we need to be doing to be actively um, making sure that there is a reversal of this, dis this disfavoring and this value that we've assigned to, to people with darker skin. So anti-racism then is about pursuing racial justice by naming, really naming and identifying what racism is, understanding what it is and understanding how it, uh, how it affects people, while also being accountable for that, recognizing that we as people, um, institutions, um, whiteness has really damaged the lives of people of color. So how, how can whiteness and, and institutions be accountable for that? 
and then providing remedies for um, the real negative effects that, that racism costs um, um, and perpetrates on people's lives, okay? And while really noticing that the system of racial stratification needs to be reversed, okay? So that's really how we're thinking about anti-racism as well. I'm gonna get out of the way and invite our experts to come on. Um, the first expert that we have is Dean Bonnie Thornton Deal, who is in the College of Arts and Humanities. I could go on and on and on about her qualifications, but what's important here today is that she's one of us. She's the dean in one of our, um, in one of the schools that is premier for students on our campus that a lot of students go into. So we're going to invite her to come on with her thoughts and um, observations about anti-racism, specifically as it applies to um, education. Dean Dill, you are up. Thank you for being here today. Allison, do you want to unmute Dean Dill? Are you there, Allison? I am. Um, it's saying ask to unmute. Dean Dill, can you hear us? Can you unmute yourself? Okay. There we go. Thanks. Is that, okay, good. Thank you. Um, and I'm really pleased uh, to have this opportunity to um, share some thoughts with you and really raise a bunch of questions uh, for our consideration today. Um, the first thing I want to say is that I've taught uh, courses on race, class, gender, inequality, and the intersections of these and other dimensions of difference for 40 years. So I'm pleased to see that the understanding of racism as systemic and not simply individual characteristics or attitudes is becoming part of the popular understanding. I mean, those of us who have worked in this area have of course understood it as a structure, as something that structures opportunity and assigns value. And I think those are, those are, uh, are really good ways to capture it. But to have people understand it more generally in, in the popular culture is important. And I think when we talk about things that are systemic, um, we have to think about what are the things that hold systems in place? What are the things that sustain it, that nurture it, and how is it manifested in our life? And so certainly this moment in history has drawn our attention to a number of these things. And Carlton, you certainly mentioned some of them, policing, health disparities, statues, symbols, um, all of those kinds of things. And I do wanna make the point uh, that symbols are a powerful part of the ideological infrastructure that supports and maintains systems of inequality. You know, I'm from the College of Arts and Humanities symbols, language, stories, I see, we see as tools that create shared understandings and disseminate meaning. It is the essence of what it means to be human. So in that way, I think that of course brings me to what higher education is because it has as its core purpose, using and transmitting from one generation to the next, the symbols, the languages, the stories, and the understandings of culture. Now, that, that may be a little bit of an oversimplification, but I think you get my point. Mm -hmm. Higher education is a key institution of the ideological infrastructure that supports and maintains our social system. In other words, these structures of inequality are supported and maintained by a set of ideologies. And higher education is a key player in perpetuating and developing and presenting and disseminating um, these ideologies. So racism and white supremacy, of course, are embedded in our system. They're embedded in our social structure. Therefore, it's incumbent upon those of us who work and lead in higher education to acknowledge and identify and challenge these ideas and to do more than just add a few additional courses and stir, but to really question the very foundations of our knowledge. Uh, that's kind of where I wanna go today. As Dean of an academic college, I've chosen to focus on challenges in three areas and to raise a series of questions that can help us identify and name systemic racism and lay the groundwork to eliminate it. And I, call it three C's. I'm going to talk about uh, curriculum. I'm going to raise some questions around curriculum. I'm going to raise some questions around climate. 
and I'm going to raise some questions around community. And all of those things, of course, are uh, fundamental to how uh, I think about the work that I do and how I think we need to think about um, higher education. So let me begin with curriculum. So the question is, whose stories are told and from what perspective? And so I raise the question, what would the curriculum look like? Because as I said earlier, it's good to add some courses and we should, I mean, we have courses and we should add some more, but, but just adding courses isn't enough. We really need to look at the totality of our curriculum and whose stories are told and from what perspective. What would our curriculum look like, for example, if our scientists were taught about the ways scientific methods and approaches have been used to justify and support ideologies of racial inferiority. Mm -hmm. This goes way back to when people were looking at phrenology and looking at brain size, eugenics, even more contemporarily IQ and, and genetics uh, all get used and talked about in the language of science uh, to justify in many ways racial inferiority, racial differences. Um, a, a hierarchy of racial groups. And what question, and then to ask if you understand the ways in which scientific approaches have been used, then what questions does that raise for scientific objectivity? What does that call scientists, for example, to do um, when they are uh, implementing something new? What kinds of questions do they need to be asking about the impact of their work? or the ways in which their data has been gathered. Um, so that's one set of questions. What would our curriculum look like if the literary, artistic, and mathematical achievements of ancient Egypt, Kush, and the kingdoms of Mali and Songhai and West Africa were as well known to our students as those of ancient Greece mm. and Rome? And I, I raise that and I put this in here because much of this uh, sense of, um, of white supremacy uh, has been based upon the idea that uh, Africa was the quote unquote dark continent and there was no learning there. Mm -hmm. And so if we knew something about that history, how would that change our understanding of what it is we teach and how we teach and what we should be teaching? And then if the American ideal of liberty was taught as a paradox rather than a reality, an mm -hmm. approach which one clearly sees displayed in the National Museum of African American History on the Mall. If it was taught as a paradox, if it was taught from the perspective of an ideal that people who were denied access to it still believed in and fought for, how would that change our understanding of American history? Now, I'm sure you can raise a variety of questions yourself that uh, would follow this line, but that's just the, I just wanted to suggest those as a line of approach. Um, second, climate. Um, so curriculum is the first thing. Climate is second. And of course, a positive classroom climate, we all know, promotes student learning and engagement. And I think that requires a lot of self-work on the part of faculty, on the part of people who are teaching in classrooms, and on the part of all of those who, of us who are interacting. Um, so questions like, do you consistently use inclusive language? Appropriate pronouns, we've already, uh, examples that speak to a variety of students' backgrounds and experiences, not just uh, the common ones, you know, I think, for a long time, a lot of women have talked about the fact that they've been in classes where uh, male professors in particular use sports analogies all the time. Well, if, if some women, because so, some women use a lot of sports analogies, but it's fine to use sports analogies, but can you also use uh, other kinds of analogies um, uh, that re relate to a variety of kinds of experiences? Um, to use examples that reflect a variety of student backgrounds and experiences, to use examples that come not only from your own culture, but from other cultures or from encounters with other cultures. Little, it's not a little thing. 
Uh, it may seem like a little thing, but learning people's names and pronouncing them correctly um, is really important. It matters a lot to people. And finally, being faculty members need to be prepared to address diversity issues in their class. They need to be aware of them. They need to be trained to be aware of them. And they need to be prepared to address them. It doesn't matter what the subject. I mean, I'm in areas of subject matter where these issues come up a lot, but it, they don't have to be the subject matter of the course, but people need to understand how they play out in terms of classroom dynamics, in terms of who gets called on, in terms of who speaks a lot, in terms of uh, who gets uh, affirmed, in terms of how people construct groups. And I would say encouraging faculty need to encourage diverse groups uh, formations on projects um, that so that students really learn to work with people who have different experiences and different backgrounds and learn the value that difference can make. Finally, my last point, because uh, I know I'm probably running out of time, is community. Who's in the community and who isn't? What are the criteria for entry? How are different groups of people distributed in, throughout the community? So again, yes, we need more uh, faculty of color. Yes, we need more black faculty specifically. Yes, we need more black students. Yes, we need, we have a diverse student body. Yes, we need students from all of these places. But the question is, what, who, is who is excluded from this community? What are the criteria for entry? Are these the criteria that we should continue to have or should we have other criteria? And, um, and, and once people get in, how are they distributed throughout the community? Who is doing certain kinds of work or in certain kinds of classes? Um, and what is the work that's being done to expand and enlarge the community? And then finally, not only expanding the community, but what does the community look like when you get there? What does inclusion in the community look like? What should it look like? And how do we go about building a place for all of these kinds of differences, but that really are inclusive of uh, and respectful of the many different ways that people come together? Uh, I could talk about this a long time, but this is my time. So the three things I think about as um, uh, a dean of a college are the curriculum, the um, uh, climate uh, in classes and in the college generally, and the community, who's in it, who's out, and how can we uh, expand uh, who is in the community, recognizing that as we expand who's in the community, that expansion changes the climate and it raises some different questions about what's in the curriculum. So that's um, me. That's me. I'm out and uh, we'll bring the next one in. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dean Dill. We really appreciated that. Um, one of the things that I find myself talking about a lot on campus, especially when I'm talking to folks in STEM areas, is that science is not objective and we have to be thinking about who are the people who are creating science and what were their values, what were their cultural ways of being. And so you were really highlighting that in the beginning. And certainly we're going to have um, Dean Kiger here to talk a little bit about the School of Engineering a little bit later, but I think that's certainly one of the pieces that, that we need people to be thinking about, um, especially in areas where they don't think that race and racism and some of these other socio-political constructs apply to them, to really shift their way of thinking that it's the people who have created the science and the people, right, um, carry the racism or carry sort of like the oppressive systems with them and we will reenact them. So thank you. Um, hopefully we'll get a chance maybe to talk a little bit more about some of your ideas at the uh, after we hear from our third speaker. Um, next up, we're gonna have Dean Adrian Lim, who is actually newer to our campus. Um, but Dean Lim, I met a few, uh, probably a few months ago, maybe, um, doing a training in the libraries. And I was really just, um, really just appreciated her presence. And so I thought that she would be a great person to add to this conversation. So Dean Adrian Lim is the Dean of, um, the, is Dean of University Libraries. Dean Lim, take it away. Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Green, and thank you to the Office of Diversity and Inclusion for inviting me to participate and for organizing this forum. I'm humbled to join you and my fellow panelists today because despite having been an anti-racist activist myself 
and having worked in higher education for 20 years, it's apparent that many of us in research library leadership, at least, and I, have not done enough. Dare I say that many of us who lead in the academy have not addressed anti-Black racism and systemic racism enough. We have not been as courageous and committed as we need to be to affect more lasting, significant change in our society. We should continually engage in critical examination and action that will work to overcome our own institutional complicity in white supremacist structures, harmful ideologies, and everyday practices that work to maintain an unjust status quo. We should invest, we should strategize, we should reallocate to prioritize anti-racist work. We know the backlash will continue to be intense, and yet still, we should do more. I believe good leaders know this is a time to listen and act more than to talk, except when the talking will hone concrete ideas and affirm our commitment to action. It's time to let the wisdom of marginalized groups themselves inform our decisions and planning and work. For example, we now have a list of demands from UMD's Black students that we can consider. We now can listen anew to the experiences and ideas of Black, Latinx, Indigenous, Asian, and other marginalized people in our community. And we can now resolve to take more action. We can work together to add anti-racist content into our library programs, collections, and practices. We can work with other administrators to carry out strategies that will help our campus and the libraries reflect more fairly the African-American population in our state. At the libraries, we care deeply about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but we do this knowing that librarianship itself is still a stubbornly mostly white profession. In that context, and using the tools of critical librarianship, we're examining our commitment to anti-racist work. A crucial part of our role is to preserve and promote cultural history, for example. And we have turned a critical eye toward examining whose histories and whose voices are we including. In this area, the libraries has made progress thanks to a few librarians and library workers who are deeply invested in this work. But we, the collective we in the libraries, can and will do better. We hold special collections and archives relating to African-American experiences and the civil rights movement in Maryland and the region. We have plans to strengthen our support for the Stamp Your History Project, an initiative to build an inclusive student life collection. And we host the Diversity Immersion Institute, which is an immersive learning experience that helps to promote awareness about library and information science among African-American youth. We've created a diversity fund for investing in more inclusive resources and events. Yet, we can fortify those efforts to increase Black participation at our library table. We can ensure that there are more African-American perspectives in our collections and programs. I commit to helping my library colleagues achieve these aims with more resources and prioritization in the years ahead. We are stewards in the libraries of many information resources which allow people to learn about the world, including its many failings and possibilities. Helping researchers to make connections and discover new knowledge is an important part of any project where truth helps us achieve our goals. We will continue working with professors and instructors to empower students through our library teaching and we will join together in advocacy and action to enhance research and uh, learning when it comes to racial understanding. As I reflected on the other points I wanted to include in my 10 minutes today, especially about serving as a leader in the academy, I pondered the question, why does a movement towards social justice and equality matter so much to some of us and not to others? A quote from John Dewey himself a controversial figure when it comes to race and gender, may provide one answer to this question when he said, 
quote, the prime condition for a democratically organized public is a kind of knowledge and insight which does not yet exist, end quote. If we need a kind of knowledge and insight that does not yet exist to make this anti-racism struggle and moral imperative matter to more people, how do we go about building and attaining this knowledge? What kind of structures, commitments, and principles do we need? These are perfect questions to be considered and acted upon in our university's courses, research initiatives, and our libraries. And we need to develop sustainable mechanisms and funding to address them. As Ananta Kumar Giri, a professor in the Madras Institute of Development Studies phrased it, quote, knowledge itself has become imprisoned within a variety of structures of domination, commodification, illusion, and isolation, end quote. Well, imprisoned knowledge is obviously antithetical to the idea of openness and change, and it is not a prime condition for an anti-racist future or a democratically organized public. This is why the library at UMD concerns itself with increasing equitable open access and open education, and why these concerns are aligned with concerns about systemic racism. As in any kind of knowledge created or gained, transformation must involve the self and knowledge of other persons and then knowledge of the world around us. For me, my passion for libraries is because we exist to help this transformation come about. We exist to help people achieve the first act of liberation, which is to demand back our own heads, as Raya Donetskaya once phrased it. Mm. Knowledge certainly won't happen unless and until more of us get back our own heads and as a requirement of openness and change. This means confronting and questioning the ideologies, the paradigms and assumptions about ourselves and our institutions that we take for granted every day. Many of us, especially black, indigenous, and people of color, have gone through years of reflection, study, and struggle to get back our own heads. But we know this process is never ending. That's why we must work together, students, faculty, staff, deans, administrators. None of us can achieve this lasting change alone. We need each other. We need to support each other and take care of each other so that we can live to fight another day. As Gary so eloquently phrased it, quote, suffering comes from the structures of domination imposed upon us, limiting our reality, limiting the possibility of coming together and freely learning and sharing our hearts. Joy comes from the very striving toward it, despite these imposed restrictions and fears of many kind. Mm. Joy emerges from experiences of breaking open such boundaries and realizing liberation, end quote. Mm. This is what I will do as a leader in academia, what I hope my library colleagues and university colleagues will do. We will join with you to counter anti-Black racism and other ideologies and systems that dehumanize and oppress people. And we will do all we can within our power, our resources, and our work to create a better society through education and research that's focused, a society in which all people can thrive. I hope we will start first by co-creating a roadmap toward our common goals, adding more anti-racist work into the universities and the library's strategic plans, plans which drive investment, focus, and attention. We've already begun doing this as part of a step up forum held in the libraries earlier this month and the work will continue. As our inspiration, in addition to the passion we feel for ensuring your success and your flourishing, we can remember ta Coates' recollection about the meaning of the library in his life. Quote, I was made for the library, not the classroom. The classroom was a jail of other people's interests. The library was open, unending, free. And it's a crafting and stewarding of this kind of library that is our commitment to all of you in the library's anti-racist work. Thank you for your work and thank you for listening. 
and we look forward to working with you towards our aims. Thank you so much, Dean Lau. Um, I'm so glad I met you. Thank you for being a part of this conversation. Um, a few things that, that really stood out to me at the beginning, you were really talking about how is it that we bring to the table Black voices and how do we honor those Black voices such that we actually hear what, what, what folks are saying in order to be able to um, uh, move towards change. And also what you're talking about, how do we use, how do we put resources in place, not just lip service, you know, um, but how do we actually use the resources that we have to move towards anti-racism? Even thinking about um, as the libraries has access to so many resources that are, that are, that are um, important for research at, at, at our institution, but how do we use those resources to really um, move forward an anti-racist agenda becomes important. And then just the closing about the curiosity piece, how do we move into a place of curiosity? We, and libraries really are, so like the, the symbol of curiosity, if you will, so that we can ask more questions rather, rather than foreclosing on answers, right? Um, so thank you so much. When we were thinking about this conversation, we really wanted to um, have a diverse voice, a, a diverse group of people sitting at the table, which you saw the last time that we were here. And you see here again today, um, thinking about the arts and humanities and about the libraries, which is that we don't think of as sort of like one of the academic um, components of our institution, but certainly it's, it's critical to um, the academic mission of the institution. And then also, how do we get people in the sciences, technology, and engineering math in the STEM fields to be engaged in this conversation as well? So I invited Dean King Kiger to be a part of this conversation. Dean King Kiger and I have been um, partnering in one of the um, School of Engineering's efforts to make sure that diversity and inclusion is an important part of the conversation for incoming students over there. So we've worked together for the past couple of years on Clark Lead. Um, which I think is a stellar program that they're doing to really um, onboard incoming students with diversity and inclusion as a key part of that onboarding. Um, so uh, my interactions with Dean Kiger have always been, I've always valued them. So I thought he would be an important voice to bring to this conversation as well. So thank you, Dean Kiger, for being here. Um, and you're up. Thank you very much, uh, Carlton. Um, I, am, I am truly humbled and, and grateful to be asked to participate in this series following the, the powerful and experienced voices that have preceded me. Uh, as you can tell, this is not my area of scholarship and I am learning how to be, uh, cons play a constructive role and an agent for positive change. So with all due respect, I, I ask for your patience uh, as I, I move through this and, and if I should express something in a clumsy manner. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in my conversations with uh, Dr. Green about this event, uh, we, we decided that it might be somewhat useful to share my own journey along this direction because it has a lot of points that I think many of my colleagues might also have in common. I am, as you can tell, uh, come from a, being a background of being a privileged white male. Um, and uh, specifically, I was born in Michigan and at a young age moved to a small town in northern Arizona that was not terribly diverse, population about 25,000 people with just a single high school. Um, even so, from that early age, I was raised with the perspective that having a, um, you know, everybody has an intrinsic uh, qualities and an and equality about them that we should respect, and there are, there are no differences based on race, um, color or skin or religious background. And at, at, that is pretty much where my, my education for a long time seemed to halt on these matters. And I was in a, in a mode of believing that if I this, do this little bit, that this is my part and everybody is thinking this way and that's how we'll uh, move forward on this. Like it's a long task, and, but this is the way that um, we can go forward. When I graduated from high school, I went on to uh, the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. So from 25,000 people next to about 20 million people in the greater Los Angeles ba uh, basin. It was an eye-opening uh, experience, as you can imagine for me. Uh, a lot of transformative experiences. I was able to study abroad for a year. Um, they have a diverse population of 50% of the students there are from another country. Um, but even so, uh, all of the learning that I happened there was still focused in, in such a way that I didn't really grow beyond that. In fact, when I graduated from there, I went down to graduate school in San Diego in 1991. And the following year, next, um, was the Los Angeles riots after the Rodney King uh, event, which was probably the biggest upheaval, racial upheaval that we've had in our country since before I was born. 
And even though I, I paid attention and was concerned about this, I still did not understand what was the true underlying source of that. And I, I, I just didn't get it. I was in graduate school focusing hard on my scholarship, trying to be the best that I can in, in sort of my engineering discipline and was came and got a job here at the University of Maryland in 1995, being an assistant professor, having your head down, uh, doing the engineering work. It really wasn't until I became through the ranks and, and graduated sort of as a full professor and then started uh, leadership positions in administration that I really had a chance to reflect more on this. Uh, next piece. And as I did that, I, you know, I, I always had this perspective that doing my little bit and my little, uh, you know, worldview of being a good person was like, we're all working together, pushing this boulder up this long slope that's going to take a long time to get there, but we are making progress. And the, the recent events for me have been uh, a real revelation in that I found out how, just how the pervasive structural aspects of racism in our society around us that I had been missing have been there all along, despite my ignorance. The next, next bit. And so really I felt like the boulder wasn't where we had been pushing it, but it had rolled me over and was actually hundreds of yards back down the slope. And I really needed to get back in the, and help push that up by helping to dismantle those parts that have structurally been part of that. So with that, um, enough about me. Um, let me talk more in general about engineering. Um, and I think there's two pieces that I've really divided this into because of where I'm coming from and my administrative role. I see there are two, in my limited time of observing this over the last number of years, um, there are two main features, I think, to where we need to be working at. One is how we train our current students uh, in STEM and engineering, and the other in thinking about what are the, the pathways into these disciplines and the, and the, the systemic portions that are there that need to be dismantled or corrected. Uh, so engineering as a profession, of course, has its part in systemic racism. Um, you can think of countless examples that could fill many, many slides, but just to point out a few, there's technical decisions that led to the Flint water crisis. There are siting of public transportation and infrastructure projects, even as close here in College Park as to where the uh, metro station was placed. Um, you know, more recently, there are things like facial recognition software, which has well pointed out flaws and short sightedness and how it's constructed. Um, and even this example here, if you could play that, that may seem a bit more innocuous, but are pervasive. Uh, if you could play the, uh, the, the link. Uh, this is a, a device that is very technical in nature where it uses a light sensor to automatically dispense soap. And here, the, by, well, there, it's probably not by design, but just an oversight perhaps, but the result is tragic in that the, if your pigment of your skin isn't the right tone, it doesn't actuate. So repeatedly placing hands of white or black behind it, one produces a result, the other does not. So whatever the process that went through to divine the site was clearly flawed and something that needs to be addressed in our education system from, from the get-go as engineers. If we're not doing this, we're a failing society as a whole. <laughs> Next slide. So in thinking about training our current students, uh, we need to be intentionally having this conversation explicitly in order to make progress. If I go back to when I was an engineering student as an undergraduate, it was 140, 136, whatever credits of purely technical material. There was no talk of sort of the broader social context. You know, that was somebody else's work that they had to be done. In my time as an academic, I've seen a shift in this, thankfully. Um, you know, starting maybe about 15, 20 years ago, the Accreditation Organization for Engineering put in a recognition that there needs to be discussions about uh, greater societal context and how this is put into place. But even so, it's only really in the last decade that I think the pendulum has started to swing in a meaningful way. Part of what um, a few things we have been doing along this line, as, as uh, Dr. Green pointed out, is Clark Lead is an onboarding process that we do on the first day with all of our uh, engineering students. We grew it last year. It was a piloted two years ago, and we had it with about 800 students for four hours in the afternoon at the hotel before the first day of classes. And we talked about sort of leadership from a strengths position and used that to segue into a conversation about diversity and inclusion and the importance of that in the role of engineering. 
that's just a start because four hours, of course, is not a way to, that this topic needs to be treated and we need to build that out in a more comprehensive manner. Another point that has been slowly gaining traction is electrical engine and computer engineering has a course, uh, ENE e 200 called Technology and Consequences, Engineering, Ethics and Humanity. This is a required course for their students. And I think it's one that should be required for all of our engineering students. It's a gen ed course um, and we're working towards that, but there they have conversations about these uh, topics in there as a part of that. And then lastly, in our curriculum, I think we need to have meaningful engagement specifically about anti-racist design in our design courses that happen at the senior capstone level and also at the introductory level. Um, I'm not aware of any at this time, but I think we should be seriously asking ourselves how we can build this into it and to do it. Uh, and I think there's a lot of my colleagues that also are interested in going this way. Next slide, please. The second part of what I wanted to briefly talk about and what I see as a, a bigger challenge because it extends beyond what we can directly control here at the university is the equality of opportunity to pursue and to succeed in STEM disciplines. And there are a couple pieces to this that I see. There's one about perception and this speaks I think to uh, Dr. Uh, Thornton Dill's um, comment about community. And then there's also preparation. Um, I'm showing you here on this one little slide is sort of in the Clark School of Engineering, so, uh, sort of a breakout of our student enrollment over approximately the last decade. And there you see highlighted with the, the gray region and in a little bit bolder are our black and African American in participation. And it is, I'm sorry to report, um, sad in that where we are in that representation. We have been making incremental progress. Uh, if you go back uh, even before this, there are times when we've been higher than this, but it regressed a while back and now we're slowly trying to claw our way back. Um, if you think about the representation of the state with uh, approximately 30% Black or African American, I see this as being way off the mark. And even nationally, uh, if we're closer to around, uh, I believe, 14 or 15%, we have a long way to go. I personally won't be happy until we are basically representative of the broader demographics of our, our state and our country, both in terms of our typically underrepresented groups and in terms of women and in terms of black and African Americans and other uh, minorities. So the question is, what can we do about that? Next slide, please. Um, one of these is about a perception and getting people to say, I can see myself as an engineer or as a scientist. Um, and I see outreach as a, an important way of, of doing that, and we have been doing that. So it's not clearly not the only answer. We have a, a, a diversity of programs and people spend their careers working on this. And that's, I think we have made progress from where we were many, many years ago. Programs like Sea Perch, Spice Camp, uh, Pre-College Scholars, as well as the Esteem Surquest program that we've been running all make a meaningful impact and difference in trying to uh, help people move to that. Um, but uh, also once they get here though, the faculty that they're seeing as was pointed out is a, a problem for us. We have less than 5% of our faculty and I, I have t tenure track there, but it's also holds true in professional track faculty that play an important role in our college. Um, less than 5% are identified as black or African American. And with those smaller numbers, it's really hard for our students to, I think, project themselves into a, a position of success and seeing them do that. So this is another area that we really need to make progress on. The next slide, please. And the other piece is getting into our disciplines. Um, and in my opinion, standardized testing are a big impediment to sort of equitable admission processes. On the surface, I can see that standardized tests seem like a good idea is that they can give perhaps an objective measure if done properly. Uh, with a lot of different school systems, but in reality, those with the socioeconomic means to help their children prepare for that and to become good test takers are at an advantage, and those who cannot are at a disadvantage. These are the, the numbers that we have in, for our freshman admitted uh, students in engineering, and they're stellar by any stretch of the imagination, but for me personally, I'm not sure that numbers this high really correlate with success in our particular program. Once you get a certain score, I don't, I don't think that they sort of lose their meaning. So given this, my own preference would be to do away with standardized testing and admission altogether for our program. That's my particular opinion and uh, will advocate for that, but um, I'm sure there's a lot of points to be discussed there. 
Next slide, please. And this is my last one. Um, the other one is, uh, I think, harkens back to uh, these wider gaps in preparation and the systemic um, inequalities that are built around that in our school systems. Engineering is a degree program that is based on a foundation of advanced math, physics, and the other sciences. It is the tool set and the language that engineers do use to make their designs. And being successful on those topics have an impact in being successful in the program and in the time to degree. So we need to do everything we can to help have equality in the school systems to serve those students so that they can all participate in our program. This is not just a problem for our colleagues in the College of Education to solve. This is something for all of us, in my opinion, to take up and to promote and to reach back and engage with. So what that means is I think we need to have our students, faculty, and staff uh, engaged in a meaningful way with the uh, school systems in the region to help build them up and to have competency there. And I think we should have more of our engineering students going back into being K through 12 teachers. Just the last two images I'll comment on here. I think there's a fantastic program uh, in, in CMNS and College of, Engineer, uh, College of Education, the Terrapin Teachers Program. I'd like to emulate that where there are actually faculty that have split appointments between the school systems and the university. Um, and this way they're teaching in both environments and able to uh, understand and help bridge between those two things. I think that, that would be a fantastic thing to build upon. Um, also, I'm showing there a slide of College Park Scholar Science, Technology, and Society where they have their robotic service learning program where they send cohorts of our students back into the school systems to help um, teach robotics and to be engaged in that. And there's a really a two-way interaction there that helps people understand on both sides. One, that the, the, the K through 12 students understand that they can do this and two, our students have an increased awareness about the challenges in the school system and the role they can play to change that. So I think with that, I'm well out of time and I should stop here. Thank you very much. Great, great. Thank you, Dean Kiger. Um, what I'd like for us to do with our remaining few minutes is maybe address a few questions. There are quite a few that have come in. Um, why don't we start with one? Well, let me say this too. One of the things, one of the reasons why I really wanted to invite Dean Kiger here to be a part of this conversation because I do think that it's important that we do have our white administrators involved in this conversation around anti-racism um, with folks understanding that we all need to participate in this and my partnership or my, my collaboration with, with Dean Kiger over the course of these past few years has so, certainly spoken to um, a willingness to step into the conversation even though it can be really anxiety provoking especially for some of our white administrators, so I really appreciate that. I also appreciate even sort of hearkening back to a part of the conversation that we had last time where Dr. Janelle Wong was also talking about the need to be um, in reflection about how it is that standardized testing may be a part of the racist system that keeps students of color out of higher education um, and certainly tracks them um, in a way that doesn't necessarily benefit them, right? So, so it becomes one of the pieces that we do, do need to be thinking about as an institution. Um, thank all of the panelists. One of the questions that we um, have here is um, thinking about students coming back on campus in the midst of COVID-19. What is our hope for moving anti-racism forward, anti-racism work forward in the midst of COVID and having an election? Anybody want to sort of step into that question? Nobody wants to step into that question. <laughs> I did, you know, the last time when, as we were talking about this, I see you just came on Dean Deal. I will say something really briefly. Um, the last time we were here, I was really saying that anti an anti-racism lens would position us around this conversation around bringing people back to be thinking about who are the most um, uh, at risk when it comes to COVID-19, knowing that our black and our brown folks who are coming back to, to in their roles as facilities management people or custodial folks, um, that we're, and, and people who might also be of a certain age, um, we really have to be thinking about that even right now, right? Are there ways that we want to ensure that they will be protected? Are there ways that we need to be thinking about um, compensation given the high risk nature of their jobs? Um, an anti-racist perspective would really say, how are we taking care of these people? How are we helping to um, minimize the risk and compensate them for their bravery, really, and um, being on campus at this time? Um, Dean Dill. 
Yes, um, Carlton, I think that's a great question because one of the things that uh, this has shown us, that the whole COVID thing has shown us, is that the people that we call, um, you know, the people we applaud, the first line responders and all of those people are overwhelmingly and certainly in this area, black and brown people and um, who are also ha at higher risk. So for example, I think questions about um, testing. Should all students be tested when they come onto campus and they, and they live in the dorms? The people that will be interacting with those students more than probably faculty who will be, many of whom will be teaching online, will be the housekeepers, will be the people who are uh, cleaning up uh, in those spaces. So I think um, adequate PPE, I think really training our students to understand because I know the whole thing about wearing masks and all of that kind of stuff is probably going to be, I mean, it's already been made controversial in the country mm -hmm. and it's certainly going to be something that students may or may not, you know, want to do or feel the need to do. But the point of wearing the mask is to protect others. It doesn't so much protect you. And so even orienting our students as they come back on campus to their responsibility to protect the people who are serving their food, who are all of these places. I think that would be, that would be one anti-racist thing. Thank you. It really goes back to your point of community. Who's in our community and how are we taking care of them? Um, Erin, were you going to say something about that issue? I just agree with Dr. Dill and I think that actually translates to anti-racist work as a whole that um, this work is not just about ourselves. And of course we have that self-reflection and the work that we need to do, but this is about our community. This is about everyone in our community. And so that perspective that we show that care and the value of all lives um, and that we want to show up to do that in a way that actually benefits our community and in turn, that is also valuable for our, our own selves. But I, I think that translates you know, from COVID and even more broadly to anti-racist work. Mm -hmm. Dean Lim? Well, um, when, uh, when the university has an emergency, um, similar to the one we're in now with COVID, uh, there's a category of employees called essential employees. And it just, this question just reminds me that we could look at some of our existing policies um, with an anti-racist lens and understand how do we define essential employees and what is the compensation that those essential employees are given. And, I, and as uh, Dean Dill mentioned, and, and Aaron also, that, that the idea of who and what work is essential that's changing um, our understanding living through this pandemic. So that's just one example, but yes, to review some of our policies can actually have a real world effect on um, disproportionately, you know, groups of uh, employees and colleagues who are people of color, black, indigenous. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm looking at the time and we do have, like I said, a hard stop with, <laughs> with one of our panelists needing to leave. So I'm gonna give some closing comments here um, for us really briefly. Um, first, I just want to say thank you to the folks who joined us today, of course, um, to um, Dean Dill, to Dean Lim, to Dean Kiger. I really appreciate your, contrib your contributing to this conversation. Um, I, what I'm hoping for is that we're really stimulating some conversation across campus around these issues, um, because it's part of what we actually need to be doing, especially as an institution of higher education. How are we getting people to lean into difficult thinking around these issues? leading to, of course, behavioral change. Um, that was one of the questions that came out. And so we'll hopefully, over the course of the next few teach-ins, we'll do that. Um, I wanna say again that we wanna continue these teach-ins um, and maybe even guided by some of the questions that you've submitted that we didn't get to. Certainly, how is it that people who are not at the senior level, who are not at the dean and above level, what do they need to be doing around anti-racism leadership in their respective areas? Um, and so that becomes a really important question that we wanna be able to provide some direction for when it comes to people who are um, interfacing with people on a daily basis. Um, we also are gonna encourage people to sign up for the ODI newsletter um, that you can have more information about um, some of the, the teaching um, uh, 
uh, teachings that we'll plan. But I think that the next one that we really want to be able to put forward for people is a conversation with students. How are students experiencing our campus and what is it that they have to say about anti-racism on our campus? There are so many others though that I'd like to be able to, to move forward with thinking about anti-racism specifically in the classroom. Um, what does it look like for white people to be talking about anti-racism? So maybe with a panel of white folks who are engaged in this work. Um, we're also going to encourage you to keep checking out these teaching videos online. This one is, will be available as well as the last one. Um, join the conversation. If you are a faculty member, a staff member, a student who is really passionate about these issues and you want to contribute your voice, reach out to us at Diverse Terps um, and let us know if you, if you have an area of expertise that you want to, to talk about and we'll figure out how to get you on, into the conversation. We also want to just acknowledge that um, UMD Solidarity is one of the places where you can get a lot of information about these issues. Um, we note that the Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion, Dr. Georgina Dodge, will be leading a number of community conversations over the course of the next few weeks, inviting um, our community members to give some perspectives about racism on our campus. Um, we know that some of those have already been filled, but there could be another round of those conversations just to make sure that we get a number of voices into, um, give into the uh, conversation with our administrators. So those are some of my closing comments. Really, thank you all. Thank you to the School of Public Health for being a co-sponsor and thank you to the um, Center for Diversity and, and Equity in Higher Education for also being one of our um, sponsors here. We are really looking forward to continuing these conversations. Um, uh, Allison, before we close, make sure that we save the chat as well so that we can have those, those comments for later. Thank you again, everybody. We really appreciate you being here.